what is the link between sleep and stroke? How do you think of this relationship? Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest topic and part of my advocacy work is obstructive sleep apnea, which we know is very prevalent. And the mechanism in terms of how that causes stroke is very delineated now. In fact, Allison, there's a lot of studies that show that obstructive sleep apnea is an independent risk factor for stroke, just like high blood pressure, just like diabetes, and just like smoking. So that is a clear association, no brainer. There's no question about it. And when you dig deeper, just obstructive sleep apnea. So without high blood pressure, without high cholesterol and diabetes, leads to up to a three times increased risk of having a stroke, just with having sleep apnea. Whoa, okay, so then what happens if we treat the sleep apnea? Do we actually prevent stroke? We can, for sure. And there are longitudinal studies showing, mostly with CPAP, because it's been around for so long, that over a five, 10 year period, so a lot of these studies were done in Spain by Martinez Garcia, and it showed that it stabilized the incidence of stroke, especially in patients who had that first stroke. If they had sleep apnea and treated it with CPAP, the likelihood of having another stroke was really low, whereas those patients who didn't use the CPAP machine kept having strokes over that Mm. five, 10 year period. So we know that it works, we know that it's effective, and luckily we have other forms of treatment beyond CPAP, which is really cool. So now we have more tools in our tool box for patients with sleep apnea. So I love something that you said, which is just how clear that data is for, I think what we would call in the medical world, a secondary prevention. You've had a stroke, we're now preventing it by getting you to actually be compliant with some therapy. So the best data I'm hearing from you is really on CPAP, which, you know, that's the machine for your breathing that a lot of people are, you know, now very accustomed and familiar with. Do you know if there's any data looking at uh, oral appliance therapy or any of the other types of modalities, or is that sort of in the works trying to figure that out? I think it's in the works. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, partly because a lot of the literature has been looking at cerebrovascular, so heart attacks, quality of life, tiredness, Um, kind of other measures other than stroke. I actually truly believe that stroke is the silent killer in many ways, not only because people don't know about the association, but even in research, Allison, when you look at the amount of literature looking at sleep apnea and heart health, it's about, I would say, I would venture to say there's a hundred times more studies and funding that go into heart disease than there is in sleep and stroke. And that's something that we need to change because stroke can be, I would argue, even more devastating than heart disease. So this is my, I hope you don't mind, but this is my compelling call to everyone out there to get the word out in terms of the need to do more research with the oral appliances, with the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, with weight loss, with the GLP-1s in stroke patients to see if it is as effective as CPAP. And the onus is on me too, and you, Dr. Cole, um, to to think of these research studies and to get the word out and educate our patients. Preach, don't ever mind being an advocate for sleep health, please, If we and brain health, really, because I don't know about you, but if I'm gonna be around, and I, I want to level set with anyone who's listening, think about it, right? You, you're pounding those any drinks, you get untreated obstructive sleep apnea. I'm just laying in the the fake person who probably isn't that fake. There's probably a lot of people who do this. Um, You may not be getting enough sleep on top of that, which we know isn't good for you. Sort of burning the candle at both ends. You have these neurologic changes. You don't get them figured out. You end up with an actual stroke. If we're to say we'd like to give you a long lifespan, I don't know about you, but I would like to not be the person having a stroke at 50, and then maybe you can keep me around for many, many years, you know, for a long time, but maybe I'm going to have a disability for the remaining rest of my life. And sometimes that disability is more subtle. Sometimes it can really be quite profound and debilitating, like bed bound level debilitating. So this matters because 
longevity isn't just about the number of hours that you're on the planet, but what's your quality of life? And I think this really ties in very importantly. So if you're going to leave with a message, it's this is really serious stuff because I want to have my functions intact as long as humanly possible. I just wake up and I'm happy that I still have my functions intact. I'm like, woohoo, I made it through another day. And I try to look at it that way. Maybe it's just a product of getting older and realizing, hey, you know, life is more finite than I thought it was. Just, you know, being on the planet longer, you kind of see that. But this is a huge, huge message. So thank you for raising it. I want to ask you um, your thoughts on all the various studies that have been looking at primary prevention. Yep. So, hey, my doc keeps yelling at me about sleep apnea. They keep telling me that I'm increased risk for abnormal heart rhythms and hypertension and diabetes and stroke. Yep. That seems like a foreign concept to me. Mm -hmm. Why should I treat my sleep apnea? Is that really going to prevent me from having a stroke? I, want, I was hoping you could elaborate because it is a little kind of yes and no-ish, meaning that depending on which study you read, you could get a lot of mixed signals. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Allison. Um, the earlier we start, the more likely we are going to be successful, especially with obstructive sleep apnea. So in a very crude way, let me just explain what obstructive sleep apnea. And if I can share with you, I have obstructive sleep apnea. So not, I not only what? it, I diagnose it, but I lived it. I lived it. And I'm happy to share my own personal journey with obstructive sleep apnea. But it is suffocating your brain at night. We have kids, right? We have kids, whether you're six years old, 20 years old, 50, 70. When you think you're setting your head on your pillow at night to get a good night's rest, your, your brain is not getting enough oxygen, your heart, your major organs, and you are in fight or flight mode. And that's why when you wake up, most people don't feel refreshed. They feel like they've only gotten two hours of sleep when they've really been in bed for eight hours. That's why people have headaches in the morning. Their bed partners are like, oh my God, you are like, <gasps> like gasping and choking for air at night and your snoring is really awful. So obstructive sleep apnea is the most common form. And a lot of people have this impression that it's only in obese people. But you and I know as sleep specialists, it is all about upper airway. And it's about your nasal passages, it's about how big your tongue is, what, what position of sleep you sleep in, whether your tongue folds in the back of the throat and prevents that oxygen from eventually getting to your heart and your brain. So I just wanna reiterate, Obstructive sleep apnea is suffocating your brain every night.